Pastor Mike here. Hey, just want to say thanks for uh, watching our YouTube channel, and uh, may God bless you with the hearing of His Word. You know, uh, yesterday I, I spent several hours, and I, I was going to talk some about Paul's teaching, and specifically how uh, the social gospel and social justice that has come come into now, right now, is causing all the uproar in the last two conservative denominations. But I decided to tie it all together and really uh, speak a little bit about, you know, false teachings and why we are, and, you know, to be, we are to be aware of them and how we combat them, how we can safeguard ourselves against them. Uh, well, that being said, I just want to start off by, if you all turn to Acts chapter 20, and first of all, I'll say this, right, false teaching is nothing new, but I, I, I would also want to say this before I start, if you look throughout church history, and for some reason, it was, it was interesting, I saw it, but I don't, I, I, I struggle to think of a time when so many very false teachings and movements that are anti-Christian have assaulted and converged on the church at the same exact time. That being said, <clears throat> in Acts chapter 20, and verse, I'll start in 26, and you see that this was, you know, it's really, you know, Paul's and others, really our Lord's concern, a grave concern of his. The next 20, starting in verse 26, Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed therefore unto yourselves. Now he's speaking to the elders at Ephesus. Now we say that speaking to all the leaders, and you know, all leaders, all teachers within the church. <clears throat> and to all of take heed therefore, you know, guard, watch over, you know, to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. I want to stop here, that's one other thing. The, gospel, the social gospel and the social justice movement, really they just combine together. And sometimes we hear that word social gospel, and even until recently I thought, well, you know, I mean, it's not so bad, we just got to get back folks on the gospel. It is a grave heresy because what it, it has done, really, it has become another gospel. It takes the focus, it takes the focus off of what the gospel really is. And it says, basically it says this, Jesus, the Son of God, came to earth in the flesh to die on the cross so we would feel better. When you think about it, that's what it boils down to. So you can have a little better life instead of what the gospel really is, right? He came to earth in the flesh. He lived a sinless life. He offered that life and took the wrath of God upon himself in our place, died, was buried, resurrected, and ascended into heaven. And he's coming again. In a nutshell, that's the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, but he died for our sins so that we will be rescued from having to face the wrath of God. You like preaching. <laughs> but, okay, in verse 29, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, of your own self, so within the church, shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. That being said, we see, you know, even here, just, you know, give or take, 20 years after the founding of the church, you know, after the Lord's ascension and the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, all is there right knowing, you know, 
knows this. And as a matter of fact, he obviously spoke about it a lot, because God done it 31. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Verse 32, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. And he said, all right, the word of his grace. And you know, our, our safeguard is the word of God. Now, what that means, I just want to say, I, I thought of, you know, some isms that, you know, are several isms that seem to be primary in, involved in all these movements. It, it's amazing, you start looking through them all and you start seeing the same phrases, you start seeing the, the same wording, the same, you know, and they, they garble it in with the Christianese and word I like to say, uh, you know, Jesify it, but it's still false. But there's easy believism, social activism, spiritual mysticism, Marxism, postmodernism, deconstructionism, feminism, <laughs> the list goes on and on. And these are all in the church right now, in our society in the church. And now the church is actually vocally promoting and teaching and spreading all these things, it, you know, it, it should cause us great concern. You know, not fear, not worry, but concern. You know, what are, what are we to do about it? But I also want to go on and so that this is, we all have to safeguard because our flesh, you know, our, the enemy of our souls and our flesh both, always are against God, right? They're always, they're always in rebellion. They always want to lead us astray and confuse us and, you know, change and, you know, take glory away from God. But I just want to go through to show that, you know, as I said there, this has always been a concern. We just look through some scriptures and you, you can turn there or just write these down. You know, we talk about this a lot in this church, but also for those of us who are listening here, we always need to remind ourselves, you know, of, of these things. You know, what, I mean, what we can expect, but, you know, keep in mind that some of these scriptures are addressing sometimes specific types of teachings, and some there's, you know, there's not, there's not any specificity given. But the principle is always the same. There's always been false teaching, and we're always told, to guard against it. But in uh, 2 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 3, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, you might well bear with him. I'll point that out because we know it. the main person behind it, right, of course, is the devil. But also we are always responsible. You know, we are responsible in the end for what we do with these temptations. With these teachings that we 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 hear and come across, and you know, I like that you might well bear with him. How often are we told, right, that well, I, you know, it's not that big a deal, or well, that person, you know, he means well, or you know, I don't know, I, you know, I don't think they're a wolf. Maybe they're, you know, maybe they're just, you know, a little ignorant and understood. Well, first of all, understand this. We said this before, but I love the saying, it's sincerity is not the issue, truth is the issue. You know, I talked about before, and some of it may not have liked it, but I talked about, let's just say, for instance, if I was okay, that I, look, I had my gun out, I was cleaning it, it went off, I shot my wife. Now, I didn't kill her, I shot her, right? Another scenario. 
was angry in a jar. Now the thing is, right, how it would be dealt with according to a judge in a court of law would be very different. The effects on her body from that would be exactly the same. Right? It wouldn't matter. Same thing, and regardless of the sincerity of these teachers, their teaching, and uh, keep the Edmund L. head there, will produce bad fruit in us. It will confuse us, it will defile us, it will take us into captivity. You know, irregardless of what the sincerity, whether the person's a wolf, you know, whether they're just ignorant and you know they, they shouldn't be teaching in the first place, well, of course, the most should be teaching. But we know this stuff will come. But remember, sincerity is not the issue. The person not the issue. The person is whether they're actually a Christian or not, not the issue. You would deal with them the same. You would, you know, reprove them. You would point out there. You try to do that. They don't do that, right? We're, we went that before last week, right? And the week before. First and second admission. Person does not accept it, reject it. Have nothing to do with them. Just keep in mind, sincerity is not the issue. Truth is the issue. But we need, we need to be aware that this, this will always happen and, you know, it is, you know, it is the enemy of God and the enemy of his people that is behind it. But also, whether people willingly or unwillingly are doing it, you know, we need to be, we need to be aware of it and we're told how to deal with it. Okay, with well, that being said, uh, Galatians 1 6 and 9. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. In other words, right? Turned over to hell, cursed of hellfire. Damn. Verse 9, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Of course, you speak that today in the church now, right? You'd be called a hater. That's exactly what, what you're called. We go to 1 Timothy 4.1. As soon as I get to it. <clears throat> right, and we, we know these, as I was saying, we know that this has always been a deal, but we're given constant warnings throughout Scripture. Uh, chapter, 1 Timothy 4, chapter 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, very adamantly, right, that, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now, you know, in the end, where the, all these doctrines come from, right? They come from devils. And that thing, seducing spirits, remember the emphasis on all this thing, when you look at this stuff going on that I mentioned, uh, this mysticism, you know, postmodernism, deconstructionism, one of the main approaches they have is, right, experience trumps fact. Experience becomes truth. You know, not the Word of God, and you know, that's the worst thing, right? Not the Word of God, not the things that can be proven, but experience. And I mean, that's a big part about seducing, right? <clears throat> we go to 2 Timothy 4. Starting in verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables, myths, things that aren't true. Over in 2 Peter 2, verse 1. And like this is not exhaustive, I just want to notice that, you know, we talked about it before. I think most of you have heard that before, but for those of you watching, the largest topic, the topic most covered in Scripture, is false teaching. It's always been a plague on the church. Well, Second Peter, uh, chapter two, 
Verse 1, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately, you know, privately, right, secretly, shall bring in damnable heresies. Even that I and the Lord that walk them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Of course, I think swift, we see that they're not being destroyed now. That's the Lord's will of judgment. But the time will come. We know if their end will be, you know, if they don't repent. Verse 2, And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And then, finally, as uh, Brother Dean's been uh, preaching through Jude, but in Jude, starting in verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, and we know from that, you know, in other words, he's saying he, he was going to, you know, write something, you know, I'm assuming that directly related to their salvation. You know, probably, you know, something lifted up, something very edifying, help bring joy and peace. But it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before hold ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as as I was saying, you know, we are warned constantly about false teachers and their false teachings throughout Scripture. We look at church history, and we can see before Scripture also throughout it, right? In the Old Testament too. In the Old Testament too, they always dealt with it as as fact what caused the fall, false teaching. Right? Half God said. And by the way, we'll see that, right? We apply the word of God to all these things, we we be, you know, quickly safeguarded against them and recover ourselves rather quickly if we fell into it. But we can we can bat falsehood with the truth. It's the only answer to it. It sounds simple, but some people don't do it. You know, when I, when I talk about these things, it is spiritual mysticism. And one of the main things I mean by people, the main thing, this a new kind of prayer, and you got to experience God. you got to get all quiet and listen to God. It, it's very clear. God speaks to us through His Word. The Word's very clear about that. Matter of fact, these very same people that are teaching that, I'll, I'll guarantee you, just, I mean, go to your Word. People will just spend time in the Word and devote themselves and do with the Word, what the Word tells us to do, you know, we'd be just fine. I yeah? Good, I have a good example of that. I know somebody that I'm very close to that um, they were praying. And God told them to get out of the stomach on the floor. Well, they got down on the floor. And then that wasn't enough. He told them to get under the bed. So they ended up under their bed on the floor. And God told them to do that. And I warned them. God did not tell you to do that. <laughs> it's what you're saying right now. He tells us what to do. Amen. All this other stuff, again, it gets back to this very important doctrine that we're looking at. It, 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 people will do the craziest thing. I mean, it's just, and they think it's of God. It's just amazing. But then you're meaning when you point it out and go, no, God didn't say that. <laughs> Another thing you know, I, I want to point out. And this is talking, I just want to, you know, share a little personal testimony. I've, I've shared this before, and I think a lot of you know this, but early on when I was a believer, I ended up being led into it, got into the Word of Faith movement. And if you've never been in it, you know, some people, you know, I've heard people, I've even heard people say, you know, well, you know, how could, you know, how could a believer ever get caught up in that? Well, I'll tell you, they can. You know, I did. And the thing is, because the main thing there, even though I did question things, you know, I, I didn't listen, I, I didn't realize, I didn't know the word nearly as good as I thought. And I was led down the path to follow their understanding of scriptures. The few scriptures, the really scriptures that they led you along, and got away from, as Paul said, the whole counsel of God. And I also went by experience. You know, you look at these people, they smile, they talk Christ, they use the right words. But that's exactly what it is, right? Flattering speech, everything. This is, you know. And 
need, you know, to come back and how I was delivered from it was, to make a long story short, it was really going, going back and I actually, I spent three straight days reading the Bible from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22, right? And as I was reading it, a lot of it, you know, just fell away. So I, I was like, I kept saying, I, was like, I knew it, I knew it. Why did I, you know, why did I question that? But, you know, the Holy Spirit in, the, in his life with his people, you know, will take that word and, you know, and deliver us from things and will purify us and, and will set us straight and protect us against error. But we must read it. It's not just going to pop on in there. But anyway, and just to mention, you know, a lot of things, I don't want to go into all of them, but a lot of these, especially the, the answers and these things people are, are saying, the Word of God, Lona's answers, and these problems for, especially the social activism, and I include the gospel, the social gospel as we call it, is now just really become social activism. And it's not the purpose of the church, it's not biblical. And we, I wanted to spend time showing on that, but instead I just want to talk about why all these movements, why these things, because as Mike addressed, the church is here to, when we gather together to preach and teach the Word of God, feed the sheep, and then as we gather together to share one another's gifts with one another, you know, as the Lord would lead, to be a blessing one to another, to build us up in the faith, so that when we go out in the community, we are the salt and light in the community. The church does not exist to form ministries to get you know get involved in this or the other thing. If you want to join things like that, help do this or that, no point bringing the you know name of church into it, but share the gospel when you're along with it. But you see, the whole thing's been twisted around. But these, the answer is sin. The answer. Is being delivered from sin. The problem is people are enslaved to sin, and sin brings about problems. And until they're delivered from that and born again, regenerate the Holy Spirit, they will keep on sinning, and they'll be under the wrath of God. And the only thing to do that is by preaching and teaching and living. What we preach and teach is the only way we are, you know, we are to, you know, that we or to help. We can help. Because anything else we do is in our flesh. And is outside of the truth. But anyway, with saying that, a lot of people discount that on the Word of God. And when I say falsehood, we combat it with the truth. Now, in Psalm 19, starting in verse 7, and I like that in verse 1 with Char, my beautiful wife there said earlier, right? That was what I said to her when I walked in, Psalm 19, 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. But go down to verse 7, Psalm 19, verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect. In other words, these are just different descriptions coming to, right? It, the whole counsel of God, His word. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. So what are the other, right? The Word of God converts our soul, right? Makes us wise. Brings us joy, right? Enlightens our eyes. Another, another way to say it, but just opens us up so we can see the errors around us and see the darkness around us, right? And they're true and righteous all together. And more to be desired rather than gold, right? They, they use those words gold or honeycomb, right? And the taste of their eyes, right? The gold in our eyes, you know, we consider that in the world a very valuable thing. Our taste buds are right, a very tasty thing. But they're the Word of God is above all of that. And it's by, you know, the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh that led to the fall of man in the first place. So I always got to come back, you know, we always got to be wary and be careful of what we, you know, led astray by anything in the world. 
Well, that being said, I, I really want to focus on that. You know, the command, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. We have some matter with true. How important the, the Word of God says over and over again, you know, that it is true or uses, you know, other words for true. But we know that the Word of God is true. It is altogether true and altogether to be trusted. But if we go to John chapter 17 in our the, the true Lord's Prayer, as Mike always likes bringing it out, you know, they always say, <laughs> that, you know, the true Lord's Prayer of John 17, right? It's high priestly prayer shortly before, you know, he went on the cross. But during that prayer, right, he prays for us, his people. Sanctify, in verse 17, John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word, is truth. You know, if you go down there now, they pray for these alone. This is for all his people, for all time. Right? We're sanctified through the very word of God. We're set apart. You know, we're we're set apart. I mean, positionally speaking, right? We're set apart in Christ because of the sacrifice, because we believed in Him. But I also believe we are progressively sanctified through that truth, and that's what He's talking about there, right? I mean, we're sanctified through His Word, and His Word is truth. Now we go on to 2 Timothy, back to 2 Timothy again, <laughs> chapter 2. And starting in verse 15. All right, and this is unto Timothy, but also can you know go unto us all. Because we're all to progress in our knowledge of the Word of God. And I, I, you don't have to go there, but also in Hebrews, right? Paul chastised the Hebrew believers, saying, For at this time you should be teachers, but you need someone to teach you again. In other words, he was chastising them because he was saying they wanted time they, that they had, they should be able to be teachers of teachers of the word, but they had they weren't growing. Let me say, uh, 2 Timothy 2, 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So through study, prayerful study, for the purpose of growing, you know, in the knowledge of God and coming to know Him and knowing His truth so you can live it and walk it out, right, with the right heart set, right, you can rightly divide the word. I mean, our, our also this word isn't true, right? There, it, we can know the truth. That's another thing about this postmodernism, right? You can't know truth. There is no truth. It's surprising. The only thing they all agree on the one thing true is you can't know anything that's true. It's contradictory, right? Their whole thing. How to do that word study there carries the connotation, the idea of being diligent. Yep. Being, you know, be diligent. Study and show myself approved, and that's a, again, that, you know, it's so important what you're saying. Yeah. You know, and it goes down, right? And it's 16. But shun, you know, shun them, shut it down. I have nothing to do with profane and vain babblings. And that's exactly what those things I mentioned are, and all the other ones, you know. Uh, this idea, oh, there's been some uh, abuse of women that. Let's empower women. It's amazing this language is so dangerous. And I'll guarantee you, go back in time and look at it. Wow. And I'll, I'll be honest with you. Wow, sounds the same with the same people, Nazis, fascists, socialists, and Marxists. And now the church, the conservative churches themselves are using the same language. I'll guarantee you, the same kinds of outcomes will come. History, history repeats itself. That's why that old saying says, you know, uh, you know, fools never learn from history, so they repeat it. You know, we can learn from the Bible, and history itself, and the Bible that tells us that's true. Shun profane and being balanced, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Amen? I mean, if any of you take a look, look what has happened in just five years. But really, the ruts were so generations ago, but when it started, you, you look back into the seeping into it, you, you can look back and you can see the language in ever slowly, right? That privately, that secretly, bringing in down the heresies, and now it's coming to full fruition. Yes. I think with a lot of this, like you were saying, I mean, with abuse of women, is that everyone just needs to go back 
practice of the scripture, which is what you're emphasizing. Uh, and so there'll be a compromise on scripture in that area. Mm -hmm. People say there's an abuse of women, but I was thinking to myself, too, it's the same where in our society, there's no doubt about it, there's an attack on Christian white males. Mm -hmm. and that's reality. But now, let's say in this church, let's say if people from other people groups are coming in here, I'm not going to get mad and upset at them because there's an attack on quote unquote white Christian male. Mm -hmm. There I would be being unscriptural. Yes, that's going on in the society, but I'm not going to cause that to give me unbiblical thinking in the church. I'm going to be happy if there's people from other tribes and tongues and nations yeah. and so forth right. in the church because that's what we see as the New Testament church. So you can't let all those effects that are going on in society affect the church polity and affect the way that you practice fellowship as a Christian in ministry mm -hmm. in the church. Now, so you, when you talk about abuse of women, well then feminism comes to the church. No, no, no. There is yep. abuse of women, but you got to be biblical in the church. Same with yep. white young male attack, or white Christian male. You don't bring that into the church to have uh, anger at other people groups in the church. Right. Just, right. we got to be thoroughly biblical. Yeah, and you know, and that's the point about it. The, the Bible addresses these things and it will tell us plainly on, on, on what to do of all things, right? And that's just it. Well, in the beginning, right, some of these things happen as far as them going on in the church is because the leaders of those churches were not enacting any church discipline, henceforth things grow. But it's true, too, you know, that a lot of this stuff is actually, you know, we're just using it's a created crisis and that to try to overturn the Word of God. And they're compromising, you know, and it just leads to more compromise and more error. Like, well, I was just going to say, you know, the seeds of this stuff was planted a long, long time ago from Germany. It, it, there, there's no question that, that we talked about it last night how that, you know, this stuff is infiltrated from those theologians who were over in Germany and they're bringing this stuff in, and now it's just starting to, it's really starting to just uh, bloom. I mean, it's just amazing to see it. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, it's interesting to say it already grows. Yeah. Verse 17. And their word will eat as doth a canker. Yep. You know, a cancer. Yep. Gangrene. Yep. And just grows. And and, and we, we see that just happening upon us and that. And, you know, the thing is not to attack. I mean, I get into that. we we got to be careful about it. There, there are places, you know, where, I mean, we definitely... You know, I, I you know need to call people up at the same time and others, right? We need to make a difference because we are to be gentle and peaceable and be able to sit down and talk things out. But when other people just want to continue to have a conversation, and like we also need to apply biblical principles, we try to do that prayerfully, willingly. But if they reject it, then we then we leave them to God, really. I find it really interesting that, uh, you know, this hashtag Me Too thing that, you know, came out. And, uh, you know, the liberals for years have been bashing the uh, complementarian theology in the Bible, right? That, that, uh, that men and women are, you know, uh, equally viewed in God. There's, you know, equity with God, but, but they're viewed that way. And yet when this hashtag Me Too thing came out, those very liberals who have bashed God's order, okay, are the ones that are doing the most of it. I mean, you think about that for a moment. You know, Terry, what's his name, Weinstein, is he a Christian? He's not a Christian, but yet he bashed Christians his whole life. And yet, liberal after liberal after liberal who hate the things of God and hate the order of God, they're the ones that are doing most of it. You know, and yet they bash us who look at Scripture and go, oh, Paul tells me to, to love my wife as Christ loved the church. Paul tells me to love my wife this certain way. Paul tells the wife then to submit, you know, to the husband's authority and that kind of thing. They bash all that. And, and But if we would simply follow those principles, all that trash wouldn't be happening. Amen. It's just amazing. They, they shut it all down. They poo-poo it all. And they are the worst ones of all who accuse us of being abusive to our wives and people in the church that follow the Bible. You know, those, those limps that hang onto their guns and their Bibles. We're the ones being accused of, of abusing. And yet, they're the ones that are abusing. It's, it's, a, it's amazing. This, this, <laughs> This rewriting, it's just done a lot. And we got to understand, just like I said, vain babblings, empty. Yeah. It is. It's world philosophy and sociology. It, you know, it's anti-scripture. It's anti-Christian. It's anti-God. But, you know, it, 
in 2 Timothy 3, starting at 13, right. but evil men and seducers, chapter 2 Timothy 3, 13, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. In other words, he learned from, from his mother and grandmother and from Paul. That from, and what did he learn? That from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise in the salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scriptures given by inspiration of God, God breathed, right? And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly, in other words, completely furnished unto all good works. So we, we really need nothing besides the word of God and fellowship and prayer, and we'll be fine. And let, you know, I don't remember your last one, if you went to, you know, second. Second Peter three, right before he died, he went through the same thing, right? You know, all the false apostles are are here and they're coming. They're bringing, you know, damnable heresies, but continue to grow in the grace of God and in the knowledge of God. Grow in His grace and grow in the knowledge. The only way to grow in knowledge is grow in knowledge of the Word, and you can never exhaust it. And finish saying with that with a couple of quotes. First, John MacArthur said this, and I really like this. Doctrine matters. What you believe about God, the gospel, the nature of man, and every major truth addressed in Scripture filters down to every area of your life. You and I will never rise above our view of God and our understanding of His Word. And finally, why is it the truth? Why is the truth so important? Why, when it used to be back in the olden days, until the last, you know, century, century and a half, the strength of a church was always first and foremost determined by the teaching and preaching of that church. Amen. You know, and the lives of people led. Now it's described by how many various types of worldly things were involved in to help the to help the loss, as Mike was saying. You know, it, we're just, it's like the church has now been engrossed in it, getting involved in society, changed the world and everything, but not preaching the gospel. But the church's main call of all the, the leaders in that is to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. When the truth is proclaimed and taught correctly, the Spirit of God brings dead sinners to life, drives God's people towards sanctification and a pursuit of holiness. It creates unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Such a gospel-centered people will be moved to care for one another, pray for one another, and serve alongside one another, all for the glory of God. And that's what the Word accomplishes. You know, elsewhere, right now, if you read through it, I just like this, I, I didn't write it down, but again in Peter, by that word itself coming into us, when we are regenerated, when we truly are born of the Spirit of God, it purifies us. It brings a purification. Remember, it says it transforms us elsewhere. Romans 12, 2, right? We transform in the very image of the Son of God. With that, uh, let's close in a, in a word of prayer, please. Father, we come before you, as your word says, we come into your gates of thanksgiving and to your courts of praise. We thank you for your great salvation that you have provided for us in your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we see all these evils in society. We, we know sinners sin, but at the same time we see all these evils even in your people who profess to know you. These teachings have just, just corrupted the church from its head down to its foot, Lord. And Lord, it can, be, it, it can be overwhelming at times, it seems. Father, we know you are in control. And you have told us, Lord, to trust you and you know, to read your word, to grow in the knowledge of you, Lord, and, and to 
block that word out, you know, to pray, just to trust you in all things. Father, help us to do that. And Lord, help us to stand true and, you know, to serve you with all our hearts and minds, soul and strength, Lord, that we would be holy and blameless, Lord. Father, uh, we just also thank, Lord, for this service coming up, Lord. May the meditations of our heart and the words of our mouth be acceptable in your sight. May, Lord, you, you just uh, give us ears to hear the word properly teach, Lord. And may it, may it do its edifying, correcting work, Lord. And may you be glorified in all that is said and done in the service this morning. In Jesus' name. It is an amazing thing.